<laughs> but Brian Honan, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. So, good evening, everybody, and uh, I'd like to thank OWASP for inviting me to, to be here and to talk to you. Um, as Owen says, my name is Brian Honan. I run BH Consulting. It's an independent uh, security firm based out of Dublin. We, we don't sell anything, just what's between our ears. So some people put some value on that. So thankfully, that's where we are. I also set up iResearch, which is Ireland's first computer emergency response team back in 2008. It's a voluntary group uh, and a not-for-profit. And we, we, we were cross-border as well. So we take issues in from north and south. And we, we coordinate with uh, other certs around the world. I'm a special advisor to Europol in, on cybercrime. I also advise ENISA, the European Network Information Security Agency, on areas in regards to uh, instant response, risk management, and cloud security. And I lecture uh, part of a master's in, in UCD on information security. So that's just who I am, just to give you background. And when I was first asked by Owen and the gang to, to speak to you guys and give you a keynote, I was thrilled. I was honored. I was like, wow, great, keynote at AppSec EU, brilliant. And then, I went, what the bloody hell have I let myself in for? I'm not a developer. I've never, last time I developed was DBase 3 back in the 1980s. And even then, I wasn't very good. And here I am now in front of a room of professional developers trying to talk to you in a keynote at an AppSec uh, uh, conference. So uh, despite one of my most nervous and uh, intimidating talks that I have to give, so hopefully uh, bear, bear with me through it. But we talked to the committee about what will the topic be? You know, since I can't tell you about how to code securely, you know, you give me a line of code, I wouldn't tell you whether it's good or bad. And I said, well, let's try and see what lessons can we learn from the past that maybe we can apply to the future. Because as an industry, we have a big responsibility moving forward. And I'm going to go through some of those points later on. This is the first PC I had, an IBM PC1. One megabyte of RAM and two floppy disks, 260K each. I had 520K of storage. Well, not 520K, because one disk had to take the operating system. And we wanted to swap information. We had to copy it onto a floppy disk and use sneaker net, as in you had to carry it from one computer to another computer. We weren't connected to the internet. We aren't even connected to the internal systems in the, in the environment back then. But some of the stuff that we've been doing then, we're actually still repeating them today. Like, our vision of security back then has always been the walls around our network and around our systems, and we keep them secure, keep the bad things out and keep the good things inside. And that goes back to the old tradition. Everybody recognize this picture? Dune Angus off the west coast of Ireland. If you haven't been there, do go there. Fantastic, especially on a day like today. But you can see this is an old Stone Age fort. They have layered security. You have all these uh, rocks on the outside to stop the attackers, and then you've got further more walls before you can get in. And that's how we defend our corporate networks as well. You've got layered security. So we've adopted, for the digital age, we're adopting Stone Age philosophy. Anybody recognize this? If you do, you're showing your age, so you might want to keep your hand down. This is a old PC diagnostics tool from a, a group of uh, two guys out of Pakistan who wrote some logic in their tool that if you didn't pay the license, it infected your computer with the brain virus. This is the first computer virus I ever had to deal with back in 19... <coughs> just a few years ago. And how it happened, when I look back at it now, this was my first bring-your-own-device security breach. Because the person who got infected and spread the infection had an Amstrad 286 PC. He brought it in from home because the IT department in the company I worked in wouldn't buy him a PC. So he brought his home PC in, plugged it into the power in the, co in the company, and started using uh, his PC to analyze data that he downloaded from the mainframe in the then most popular spreadsheet program, Lotus123. And then he copied it onto floppy disk and transferred it to other PCs in the network and infected them. It took us about... Like there was only about, I'd say, 20 or 30 PCs in the company then, but it took us the guts of nearly two weeks to figure out what was going on and how to fix it. But that was our first bring your own device security breach. Today we do that, spread the virus the same way, plug in USB keys into computers. 
So the definition of being crazy or insanity from Albert Einstein is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And when I look at how we're developing and how we're working in the industry today, it begins to ask ourselves the question, are we crazy? Or does simply being crazy help to work in this industry? So maybe that's a question for us to think about. Because if you look at IoT, all the different devices we're putting out there right now, most of them aren't, in, aren't secure. This, this one here, these CCTV cameras, were the cause of the MyRi botnet before, just before Christmas, which took down large portions of the internet. That system had insecure operating system and, and default passwords stored on the camera so that anybody could log in and take over the camera, install malware and take part of a botnet. We have LED light bulbs that leak Wi-Fi passwords. So if you want to hack into some corporate systems, maybe just go and see have they got an LED light in their boardroom and hack that instead of hacking the network. We have Wi-Fi devices implanted in our bodies now. We have pacemakers that are Wi-Fi enabled. We have insulin pumps that are Wi-Fi enabled. All insecure with default passwords and poor code in them. If you don't believe me, there's a very good speaker from Norway, Mar Mary Mo. Um, Mary has a pacemaker inside her, inside her. She has a talk, a TEDx talk called Hackers Don't Break My Heart. And she has actually gone and done research. She has analyzed the code and hacked her own pacemaker. Well, actually, not the one in her, a model of the one that she has. And she's identified where, where the key issues are. So now, you know, with the Internet of Things, now we have the Internet of Beings. Us. We're all going to be connected. So there's, there's a lot of issues coming up there. Ransomware. I know it's probably just a good, good job Jeremiah isn't here, because <laughs> if you follow him on Twitter, you see him lately. He's been, he has a big campaign about ransomware. I have a bugbear about ransomware. It's nothing new. Ransomware is just a virus. It's a common, run-the-mill computer virus that we have been trying to deal with in our industry for the past 20 or 30 years. Yet we still can't stop it infecting computers. And some of that is down to uh, lots of issues, but some of it is actually down to developers not following good practice. And I'll give you an example, is that we got involved in doing a security breach with uh, a major financial client. We went in, they had, a, they had a ransomware attack, we went in and analyzed the attack. We gave a number of recommendations on how to prevent the next ransomware attack. And one of the key areas you can prevent ransomware infecting the computer or any piece of malware infecting the computer is disable executables and other scripts from running in the C temp and the C app directories. And we said that, and we're told, ah, sorry guys, can't do that, because our developers have written the in-house applications to all run from those directories. So we'd have to change all the in-house applications. So to me, that is a, is a big issue. So ransomware is nothing new. It's just ransomware today is easily monetized by the criminals because of blockchain technology and bitcoins and electronic currencies. Ransomware, we've had it around since the 1990s. We had a ransomware in the 1990s that you had to pay by wire transfer. Criminals weren't very successful because, guess what, it's very easy to trace wire transfers and find out who's behind it. Not so with uh, uh, Bitcoin or other electronic currencies. And if you look at cybercrime in Ireland, like through the CERT, uh, our CERT, we get a lot of issues reported to us. So we can see what's happening in the Irish landscape, and as I said, that's both north and south. So we get notifications from CERTs in other countries. We get notifications from security companies, from law enforcement, to help for us to help them shut down botnets or infected websites or compromised systems and to deal with them. 2014, we had over 6,500 incidents. Last year, we had nearly 30,000. So there's a huge, huge, I sound like Donald Trump now, a huge, big uptake in, in the amount of compromised and systems that are being, being attacked on, on this island. And when we look at who's behind them, we reckon if you look at the motivation of the type of attacks, the only reason you do that type of attack would be if you're looking for money. And if you're looking for money and you're breaking the law, you're probably organized crime.
Uh, we don't have the resources to go and analyze every security breach and, and trace it back to who's, who's sitting at the keyboards. But if you just put some logic to it, we reckon three quarters is organized crime. Root causes of most of those security breaches, it's not super ninja hacking. It's not zero days. It's poor passwords. It's missing patches from systems. It's str straightforward vulnerabilities. It's SQL injection. It's n number one. And it's, you know, we've known about that for, what, 20 years? And we still have applications going out with SQL injection and being compromised. We've found other web insecure web platforms. WordPress being set up and not being updated and then being popped. Cold Fusion being used. Out of date anti uh, operating systems. We still see machines being hacked and companies having Windows XP installed. Antivirus software being out of date or even turned off. And the big problem is people aren't monitoring their systems as well. So we're still making the same old mistakes, yet we're not learning from them. And Verizon, I uh, don't know if you're not familiar with the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, I recommend you go and have a look at it. So Verizon, being a US telco and a data center, they actually have an investigations team that go out to their clients and investigate security breaches. And they have started, you know, 10 years ago, they started to uh, uh, present the data breach investigation report based on their customer base, saying this is the type of breaches we see, and this is the common cause of the issues we see behind it. Now, that was very good, but it was only aimed at their customers. US customers, large corporates, so apply that to the Irish environment or the UK or European environment, it didn't really hold much water. But as you can see there, over the years, lots of other organizations have become involved, and they're sharing their, their, their information with Verizon, who are then analyzing it. And one of the organizations being iResearch, we anonymize the data we get, we share it with Verizon, and we talk about the different types of breaches we see. And that's Verizon analyzer. And in the report, they present some interesting information. And the report is very easy to read, so do take it uh, uh, down. Uh, some, of the, some of the key things there is that you can see half, just the bottom blue one there, half involve organized criminal groups. So we said three quarters uh, in our analysis. But if you look at this, what tactics did they use? 62% featured hacking. Over half of breaches included malware. And I would say I'd be willing to put money on that. That vast majority of that was ransomware. 81% of hacking-related breaches leveraged either stolen and or weak passwords. So still today, we haven't grasped that password one is not a secure password. People are still using insecure passwords. So we do have to ask ourselves the question, are we crazy? Are we repeating the same mistakes over and over again, expecting different results? And if we are, well, then I think we're taking the wrong approach, and we need to dramatically change things. Because there is an old, I only found this out when I was putting this presentation together. I thought this was an old Chinese proverb. May you live in interesting times, or a Chinese curse. Turns out it's not. It's not. Who knew you can't attribute anything on the internet? You know, attribution is hard. <laughs> But may you live in interesting times. And I think we are living in interesting times. There's a lot of you who are probably starting your career now. And in 20, 30, 40 years' time, the whole world is going to be different to what it is today. When I started working back in the late 80s, the only electronic thing on my desk was a calculator. We had a computer terminal in the corner that we all shared and worked on. You had to take turns to use the computer terminal. There was a phone between four desks. So that has all changed. How will our work, how the, how's the future going to change? And we, as an industry and individuals, we have a lot to say in that future as well. Because we are now living in the fourth industrial revolution. First one being the, uh, sorry, the, the fourth uh, industrial revolution. The first one being steam and everything else, and then motor, uh, automation, and now you've got cyber. I hate that word, by the way, but it's, 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 it's what's happening. Everything we do and everything we own is now connected worldwide. We all have smartphones in our pockets, connected to everything. We talked about our homes, 
our fridges, everything else is being connected to the internet as well. What we do and how we shape that technology is going to impact millions of people around the world and in the future. If we don't get this right, lots of people are going to be insecure. How would you like to have a pacemaker that could be hacked? I forget the gentleman's name, but the, the guy who is the owner of uh, Tesla is talking about having a chip implanted in your brain to, to connect you to the internet. That's the next research party is going to look at. Wow, cool. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> but that's where we may, may be going. So there's, there's a lot at stake in the future. All our medical systems are going to be there. Our medical data is going to be stored in huge databases. How secure are they going to be? The medical devices that we're going to depend to keep us alive or to operate on us in the future are going to have computers on them and programs on them and applications on them. They're going to have code. Our transport is going to be automated. Any of you who've got kids, if they say to you today, Daddy or Mammy, I want to be a train driver or a pilot or a taxi driver when I grow up, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, but they're in for a big disappointment. The future's not going to have train drivers. It's not going to have bus drivers. It probably won't have even pilots. We're going to have autonomous vehicles doing everything we want. And we're seeing that happening today. We, there was a, uh, an article there a few months ago about three trucks that drove by themselves from Greece to Amsterdam. Now, you take, from a security point of view, you take the damage that was done in Nice and in Germany with terrorists drove a truck into crowds of people. Imagine if you could hack a whole fleet of trucks. What damage could you inflict if you could do that? So code is becoming more and more important. This building is run by code, by computers. All the lights, temperature, the heating is all run by code. We need to make sure that is secure. The next war is not going to be fought on, in, in the fields. It's going to be fought on the, on the internet. Thanks. That, that's a, when, I, when I saw this one, I said, yeah, that definitely is going in. <laughs> this is where the next wars are going to happen. How we do finance is going to change. We're not going to have, as I put my hand in my pocket and find no money, we're not going to have money. I say, this, it's in this pocket. <laughs> we're not going to have notes in the future. We already see banks trying to move us to plastic so that we've used an NFC and, and near field technology to, to do tap payments. We've got fintech companies looking for do ways with micro payments. We have blockchain using to, to change currency. We're going to have brand new different types of currencies in the future. Pound notes, euro notes, dollar notes are going to be a museum piece in the future. Everything's going to be connected. Our houses, our cars, ourselves are going to be connected. And it's all going to be run by code. This is probably going to be the future office. As I said, I sat in an office, four desks, a phone, with three people beside me. And you walk in and go, hi, Brian, hi, Mary, whatever, you know. You walk into an office in the future, and they're all going to be there in VR, you know. How are we going to communicate as human beings to each other? What about if you could hack somebody's virtual reality? What could you inject into what they see or how they do? That's all that's going to have to be considered as well. Minority Report, based on facial recognition, as you walk through an airport or walk through somewhere else, adverts are going to be popped up based on who you are. We're seeing that at the very beginning. Who's on Facebook? Yeah. And the very, we're seeing that starting now. You log into Facebook, you have ads placed because of how you act and how you behave. It's analyzed to the nth degree to figure out what, what, what makes you tick. And that's T-I-C-K, not T-H-I-C-K. But what makes you, how you think, how, what, what can be sold to you? Or what, how can you be sold to advertisers? Is probably the better way to say it. As we walk through the real world, this is going to happen. And being Belfast, we 
and with the drinks reception, I had to, we had to put a, a virtual Guinness up there. Hopefully, you'll have some real ones later on. Uh, artificial intelligence. That's going to have a huge Im impression on how we all work. We already are applying AI to security. We're using it to analyze logs to make our responses quicker and better when there's a security breach. There's been an experiment taking all the U.S. Sup uh, Supreme Court uh, judgments since 1888, I think, to 2012. And they were all fed into a, an AI uh, machine, which came back with an 82% correlation with the decisions that were given. So you're now going to have AI making legal decisions and probably other decisions. We will probably have AI writing applications in the future. So we're going to have to write secure code to make sure that the code that writes code is going to be secure. Yeah? Skynet, anybody? <laughs> and we have seen in the past year how our own society, our own democracy, can be undermined by insecure code. We're seeing elections being uh, hijacked. Coming back to Facebook, we've seen how that data ha has been used by campaigns to analyze and target people and give them specific messages to encourage them to vote and swing their thoughts in a certain way. So we have a lot riding on the code of the future. We have a lot riding on us in this room. So we are on the edge of something big and something very major. There is a lot that we need to take into account and consider. So we can't be an island anymore. Like I talked at the very beginning about how I felt, wow, I'm speaking at AppSec EU and I'm not a developer. Straight away, I'm isolating myself from my fellow professionals because I can't code. And likewise, you guys probably who are AppSec developers, are probably isolating yourselves away from the ops guys, or the infrastructure guys, or the security management guys, or the risk management guys, because we're different. But we have to get over that. We can't be an island anymore. We have to reach out to other parts of industry, and even outside industry, and promote secure coding practices, promote secure systems into society as well. There's too much riding on this for us to be by ourselves and sit in the corner going, oh yeah, stupid users, or this, that, and we have to, to do a better job of promoting the story. I know OWASP is doing a great, great work, but I think we, we're going to have to ratchet it up a lot more, that we need to engage with people outside of security, outside of IT, so that they can better understand what the risks are and how we should manage them. Because the impact we have is too great. If we don't code securely, if we don't secure our systems, how they can be abused and misused or mistreated in the future is going to have too much of a significant impact on people. If we don't do anything, the same thing is going to happen. If you write insecure code, the same thing. We, the impact we have is literally too, too big. Even you can see the slide there, it's a drop in the water. But if you put a small drop in a pond, the ripple effect can be, can, can be amplified quite a lot. So we have to make sure that we're getting it right. So to kind of wrap up, because I know you, you guys are gasping for beer and stuff for that, uh, I want to put a call out to you all. What I want you to do is join this revolution. Okay? I was going to say I want you to be revolting, but I think be revolutionaries is probably better. But we need to join the revolution. And we need to look back 30 years ago. Anybody recognize this? The Hacker Manifesto, yeah. From the mentor. If you haven't read it, do a Google search for it and read it. But here are some of the key messages from it at the end. Yes, I am a criminal. My crime is that of curiosity. My crime is of judging people by what they say and think, not how they look. My crime is outsmarting you. And outsmarting people is not being better than people, it's just thinking in a different way. Something you'll never be able to forgive me for, the mentor in 1986. 
So looking back at that, I think we need to look that forward with that one. Uh, and bring that into how we, as professionals, move forward in the future. So with that, my name is Brian Honan. I am a criminal. I am a hacker. Please join me. So, there's any questions? I think. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you.